Hey everyone, welcome to Recalibrate this morning. Um, this is our last Recalibrate uh, for our series of Tabernacle to Tree um, before the Easter weekend. And so we are going to be covering this morning the Tabernacle, or uh, sorry, the Ark of the Covenant in the Tabernacle. So I'll just give a quick look here. And we have the holies, the, the holy place, and we have the most holy holy place. So that's the smaller section there. And uh, the Ark of the Covenant is glued down, so I can't bring it up to show you exactly, but that's where it would be. It would be in the Holy of Holies, the smaller section of the two. And in that place is where the Ark of the Covenant would be. And it was most holy, it was most sacred. Um, it was not meant for, it was not meant for high traffic. Uh, it was not meant for just anyone to go in. Um, the only person who was allowed in was the high priest. And then only once a year for Day of Atonement, where he would um, bring in a, a, a atoning sacrifice for the sins of all the people. And he would come in and sprinkle blood on the altar seven times. And other than that, um, it was it was only where the, the presence of the Lord would dwell. And so it was, it was most revered and it was most holy. And so um, in Exodus... We have, a, we have our description. So chapter 25, starting verse 10. They shall make an ark of acacia wood. Two cubits and a half shall be its length, a cubit and a half its breadth, and a cubit and a half its height. You shall overlay it with pure gold inside and outside. You shall overlay it, and you shall make on it a molding of gold around it. You shall cast four rings of gold and four it, and put them on its four feet, two rings on the one side of it and two rings on the other side of it. You shall make poles of acacia wood and overlay them with gold. And you shall put the poles into the rings on the sides of the ark to carry the ark by them. The poles shall remain in the rings of the ark. They shall not be taken from it. And you shall not, uh, you shall put into the ark the testimony that I shall give you. And then you shall make a mercy seat of pure gold. Two cubits and a half shall be its length and a cubit and a half its breadth. And you shall make two cherubim of gold of hammered work shall you make them. On the two ends of the mercy seat, make one cherub on the one end and one cherub on the other end of one piece with the mercy seat shall you make the cherubim on its two ends. The cherubim shall spread out their wings above, overshadowing the mercy seat with their wings, their faces one to another toward the mercy seat shall the faces of the cherubim be. And you shall put the mercy seat on the top of the ark. And in the ark, you shall put the testimony that I shall give you. There I will meet with you. And from above the mercy seat, from between the two cherubim that are on the ark of the testimony, I will speak with you about all that I will give you in commandment for the people of Israel. So I think I can actually take off the top part. So this is the this is the artist's um, depiction. So it would be um, where the two cherubim are, are looking together, their wings are covering, and then in between is where the presence of the Lord would be, and that's where he would sit. So that is the mercy seat above the ark. Okay, so we're talking about how these elements of the tabernacle are pointing to Jesus and how they help us to see that the Lord was pointing them in that direction, even from the Old Testament. And so with the ark, um, in Hebrews, we find out what is in the ark. As we found out in uh, Exodus just there, um, the testimony, so the two, the tablets, the um, the Ten Commandments were stored in there. And uh, also in uh, Hebrews chapter 9, um, we also read that there's other things inside the uh, the Ark of the Covenant as well. Uh, so I'll just, I'll just start in verse 3 of chapter 9 of, of Hebrews. Behind the second curtain was a second section called the Most Holy Place. So that's the smaller section um, of the Most Holy Place. Having the golden altar of incense and the Ark of the Covenant covered on all sides with gold, in which was a golden urn holding the manna. So that's one thing. And then there was Aaron's staff that had budded, and then the tablets of the covenant. And so that was kept in. So um, people would people have said that the the manna was to be a reminder of God's provision for them always. The staff was to be God's guidance and His protection, and the commandments were to be the statutes, His word to keep. And then when we look forward to Jesus, Jesus tells us that He's the bread of life, um, being the bread that we need, our all satisfying um, Lord. He is also the good shepherd. He's our leader. He's our guide. He's our protector. And then also the commandments, uh, the word. And then God gave us himself as the word. And so we have, we have um, that. And um, uh, when we're thinking about 
as a whole, when the people came to the tabernacle and they were offering sacrifices and stuff, again, my mind just goes to the fact of how incredible it is that the ark and the holy place was so, um, it was, it was so holy. It was literally set apart. No one could come, um, and just come into the presence of the Lord. Um, cause the Lord is, and the Lord is holy and it had to be a certain way. It had, it could only be once a year and it was, um, for the purpose of atoning for sin. And then to think about the fact that Jesus came to earth and walked with disciples, he walked with people, he taught people and he died for people. And when Jesus died, we read, um, oh, and so something that's very distinct is that there's a veil separating the holy of holies and then um, the, the larger portion. There's a, there's a veil and it was meant to separate so that there would be, you know, there wouldn't be any, any, uh, any chance of people seeing or going in beyond what they were allowed to do. And then when Jesus dies on the cross, not only does he, um, he dies for our sin and in so doing, I'm just going to look it up here quick. And when Jesus does die on the cross, there's something really cool that we read. Um, so Matthew 27, and let's go, let's, let's start in verse 50. And so Jesus is on the cross. Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. And behold, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. And the earth shook and the rocks were split. So this is kind of a small, it's, it's a small written detail, but it's ginormous in meaning. Because what this means is that that veil that separated people from the Holy of Holies, that veil that separated God from people, was torn. Because when Jesus died on the cross, he bore the sins of everyone on himself and made a way for everybody to be forgiven. Because the tabernacle was brought about because God wanted to dwell with his people. And because God is so holy and people are so sinful that they couldn't just come into the presence of God. So God had to instruct Moses to build this tabernacle with all of the elements, the altar, the, uh, the, the wash basin, the, the bread of presence, all of this was, they were, it was symbolic and it was to teach them about God's holiness and it was to show them about God's holiness and their lack of. And then that's all culminated in the fact that the Lord would dwell with his people, but there was still so much that they weren't able to access because of their sin. All right. So the tabernacle was a foretaste of God's presence with them. And then we fast forward to when Jesus comes to earth and then he's walking around and he's with people and then he's teaching them all the while that a new commandment he's giving. There's a new covenant now. And the covenant is of the blood of Christ because prior to Christ, there was the animal sacrificial system. And so to atone for the sins of people, people would bring sacrifices, they bring animals. And of course, the animals were not powerful enough to deal with sins once and for all. So it was a repetitive, constant part of their life was to bring in sacrifices to be forgiven and, and redeemed um, in that way. But it wasn't powerful enough. It wasn't indestructible. It wasn't, it wasn't constant. Jesus says that through his death on the cross, that he has once and for all dealt with the sins of the entire world. And because he's dealt with the sins of the entire world, people can now come into God's presence. The veil is torn. There's no longer anything keeping people from experiencing Christ in a way that has never been experienced before through the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, Christ in us. See, so now it's not uh, this, this tabernacle that was given was the physical um, representation of Christ with them. And then now through Christ's death, we're the tabernacles. Christ dwells in us through belief, through faith in our hearts. Um, it's, it's amazing. It's wonderful. Sorry. Um, yes. Uh, Hebrews 9, 11. When Christ appeared as a high priest of the good things that have come, then through the greater and more perfect tent, not made with hands, that is not of this creation, he entered once for all into the holy places, not by means of the blood of goats and calves, but by means of his own blood, thus securing an eternal redemption. For if the blood of goats and bulls and the sprinkling of defiled persons with the ashes of a heifer sanctify for the purification of the flesh, how much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, purify our conscience from dead works to serve the living God? Therefore, 
He is the mediator of a new covenant, so that those who are called may receive the promised eternal inheritance, since a death has occurred that redeems them from the transgressions committed under the first covenant. So, oh, we could spend 10 hours talking about this, but we're running out of time right now. But, so the tabernacle was a physical way that God was showing his holiness and also his love that he would come to this broken man who rejected him in the garden. He would make a way for that relationship to be brought back. And it showed, it was intended to show that man was too sinful, that they would just be constantly needing to bring sacrifices in order to have a perfect relationship with the Lord. And it just wasn't, it wasn't good enough. And then to point people even further to when Jesus would come back, that he would once and for all make uh, relationship restored with people, make them right, make it once and for all forgiveness of sins. And so now today we're walking in grace. We're walking in the death of Jesus. We're walking in his sacrifice so that we no longer to experience relationship with Christ have to keep continually bring sacrifices, but through faith, believing that Jesus is the son of God, that he died for our sins, that he once and for all paid for all that for eternity, we can boldly come before him now into his presence. His presence is everywhere. We can come before him and we can bring our requests to him and we can journey with him. It's a miraculous, it's, it's, a, it's an indescribably miraculous thing that God has done in giving us um, his word and given us the ability to see from beginning to end, he's working to restore relationship with broken people that rejected him first. And he is working to bring us into the right relationship with him. And he's done it all on the cross. And we can have confidence of that. We can have assurance of that. Um, the veil is torn. Jesus died on the cross. We are no longer, um, we are no longer needing to have to go to a priest to mediate for us, but we can come before the Lord in faith, and in hope, and we can we can have fellowship with him in a way that they never could before. It's a wonderful, miraculous story, and uh, I, I hope this has been an encouragement for you to go through these elements and just to see how Jesus has, they all pointed to Jesus from the very beginning, and that was the very intent of the tabernacle um, that God gave his people, so that they would see their need for a savior, they would see their sin, they would see the holiness of God, and they would see that only through Christ, only through a perfect sacrifice, could sin be dealt with once and for all. And that's the reality and the hope that we walk into today. I would just like to pray for us as we continue on in the rest of our days. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for who you are. Thank you, God, so much that you have made a way for us to have a relationship with you. That we have a way where we can we can come before you Boldly, we can come before you, God, no matter where we are. Right now, even as I'm praying, God, this is possible because you died on the cross for our sins, that you have dealt with the sins of everyone. Lord, that you have welcomed us to come into your presence, to walk in forgiveness, to walk in newness of life that you've provided by your shed blood for us. As we think about Easter this season, as we think about what it meant that you came to earth, that you would dwell as a light in darkness, that you would come to bring people saving grace by dying on a cross. Lord, to die for the people that put you there, to die for all of us, that we could have our sins forgiven, we could have our minds cleaned, we could have everything forgiven. There would be no more record of debt for any of us, but you nailed it to the cross. And that if we would just come before you in understanding that if we confess our sins to you, if we believe in our hearts, Lord, that you are who you say we are, that, that you are who you say you are, God, that we could have newness of life, that we could have that forgiveness of our sins. We could have that, that uh, justification. I pray, Lord, that you please continue to work that into our hearts, that every day we have, Lord, is a gift from you, that every day we have, Lord, is evidence of your presence with us. I pray, Father, for us to learn this more and more. And I pray, God, that as we um, gear up for Easter, that you would just please bring our thoughts back to your death, your burial, your resurrection, and what that means for us today, the hope that that is for us today. And so we pray this in your precious and powerful name. Amen. God bless you all and uh, enjoy your day. And may this, uh, this week leading up to Easter be one of encouragement for you, one of reflection. 
and one of great worship to, to Jesus himself. See ya.